Okay, welcome everybody to the afternoon session. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Sandy Monroe. Sandy, are you in the room? Ah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Sandy's topic, yesterday's productivity tools are not good enough for today. Please welcome Sandy. Thank you. Okay, well, um, hi everybody. Um, thank you for uh, showing up here. Um, it's, uh, it's usually tough near the end of the day, but we'll try and keep you awake. Um, Monroe and Associates has done a lot of things, and um, if you start yammering on about them, it, it starts to sound like a big, a, a big commercial. So, uh, so what I'm gonna do is just give you 30 seconds of Monroe, and then we'll start into getting everything that, that really isn't kind of important. So if you could cue that one up. So in essence, uh, there isn't much we haven't worked on. And we work on it in a couple of different ways. Sometimes it's financial. Uh, sometimes it's through product design and for the most part what you're interested in. Sometimes it's manufacturing. And so we push the button. So we look at kind of what everybody kind of does now. Um, how do we get going? How do we start making things happen? The first thing you do is you go out and make spaghetti diagrams and whatnot. Now what's interesting about this particular spaghetti diagram is it's for a dye shop. How many people here are actually in manufacturing? How many of you make a product of one? Yeah, they're very good. Well, actually most people would say, well, you can't do that. But in essence, you can. You can, you can make a huge difference. And if you look at this stuff, you can see what it used to look like and what it looks like now. And then you get some kind of results, right? Well, in a mold shop, with this mold shop anyway, uh, we said we would work with them for less money if they'd allow us to, uh, to use their examples. And you can see kind of like what it is that they've said. Wow, this is great. Our factory floor never looked better. Oh, we're getting 30% more throughput. That's interesting, but it's not what we really and truly need. Because 30% throughput doesn't really mean uh, a lot of money to the bottom line. So, we look at other things as well. For this product, the, the, uh, the precedent uh, golf cart from Club Car, I mean, we did the assembly lines. And when you look at the assembly lines, they're great. I mean, they worked really, really well. We got, uh, that's what it looks like. We got a lot of extra kick, or they got a lot of extra kick from that new way of doing the business, right? That new product line. Actually, this thing uh, puts out twice the product that the old one did, and it does it in a third of the uh, space. So you look at this thing and you say the goals achieved. Well, they went from 38% market share to 66. Actually, they went to 81% for a while. To, that, that really kicked in and really made a big, giant difference. The manufacturing um, actually uh, was improved because we got rid of 60% of the parts. But it was manufacturing driven to make that happen. They reduced the assembly operations by 60%, not by outsourcing, but by doing it a little bit smarter. They got rid of uh, fabrication operations by 80% by changing what it is that they've done in the past. And the floor space went down, like I said, by 66%. So it's only about a third. They increased their inventory turns 1,000 a year. That's a pretty big number. That's a pretty big number. But if you start looking at everything holistically, and I'm going to use that word a lot, uh, because that is exactly what I think we need to do in manufacturing. We have to attack the problem in a holistic fashion. That's why I was so interested in uh, James Gaffney's speech this morning. He used that word several different times and it was the perfect setup as far as I'm concerned because if we think about things from a manufacturing standpoint as early as possible, we're gonna make a giant difference. So how about increasing the profits? They won't let us tell you that at Club Car because maybe you'll buy one and you want a big discount and whatnot, but let's just say that they were significant because what we were doing was figuring out how to manufacture a problem, or sorry, how to manufacture a product to relieve it of any kind of problems. Same thing happened with Cirrus, only uh, airplanes are a little more complicated. That's, I don't know who can read that, but not me. So anyways, what I want to talk about today is the handoffs, okay? 
Okay? We start off and it says uh, in that little slide, no matter how hard a manufacturing engineer works, he's only going to be as successful as the product design that's been handed to him. Okay? How many people here get handed designs? Now, actually, probably all of you do if you're in manufacturing. You probably get a design that's going to meet the customer's expectations according to the product design engineer. Okay, the success of the program is all determined by the handoff, how easy it happens between the product design, marketing, and ultimately the guys in manufacturing. If the handoff's good, you got a chance. But if it's not, and you look at that little yellow circle right there, everybody's trying to do their best, but the handoff isn't going quite as expected. So you can go, you know, full tilt and really go nowhere, right, if the handoff's not successful. Now, this is what happened to the U.S. Olympic team, okay? When a loss comes, everyone loses. But if you're in manufacturing and the loss comes, well, everybody's going to blame you. It isn't because of anything else. It's going to be because of you. Now, how do I know that? Well, let's see. I started out as a... I started out in the world as a, as, as in the manufacturing world anyways, as a uh, chief engineer for a machine tool company. Before that, I was a tool maker. I kind of like know about machine tools. And I got a, one of those wonderful little offers from Ford Motor Company to come and work for them. And I started off in manufacturing engineering. And believe me, I found out real fast that if something goes wrong with the product, it has nothing to do with anybody except for the factory. The factory's got it all wrong. You don't understand. You don't understand. You got to get the product out. It doesn't really matter how it or why or anything else before that. It's your job to shove that product out the door. And it has to be at a high quality and it has to be profitable, right? So you wind up like this guy here rubbing his chin wondering, how come I'm going to get blamed for this? We've got a lot of fine tools from yesteryear. Um, we use them all. The problem is, is that perfecting the factory, using perfection processes to perfect the factory, isn't going to turn a sow's ear into a silk purse. So the thrust for this presentation is to look at what manufacturing can do to drive product. In the past, we accepted what we got. That's what we, that's how we, we figured we should do the job. I mean, they did their job, we get our job, right? Well, that isn't going to work if you're going to survive in tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's economy. And I can tell you that for sure because Monroe is an international company. And you know what? <laughs> That's not how they're doing it on the rest of the world. That may be one of the reasons why manufacturing is leaving this country at a pretty ferocious rate. We have to, take, we have to step up to the plate as manufacturing engineers or manufacturing entities. We have to step up the plate and we have to start driving more than what we've driven in the past. We have to try and figure out how to mitigate the risk. And this is where the talk that I heard this morning from James, uh, James Gaffney, that talk resonated with me. Because if we're, gonna res if we're gonna hit the targets, we have to have a holistic approach. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today is the holistic approach that is going to drive your manufacturing and make it so that your job's a whole lot easier. But more importantly, the company is a success when that, when that product hits the marketplace. Now, I had to change my presentation. My presentation uh, was a nice, safe presentation up until, um, up until uh, November the 30th. November the 30th is when the, um, when the Office of the Secretary of Defense allowed us to talk about what I was hoping we were going to be able to talk about. And you talk about, you know, <laughs> cutting it thin. Uh, we got released, as it says on the bottom of that slide, like I said, November 30th. So it's only a couple of days ago. So I'm glad to say that we're going to be able to, we're, we've been allowed to talk about what's been going on, uh, basically the funding that's been going on to, uh, uh, to Monroe and Associates so that you're going to be the beneficiary of hopefully uh, a new product tool that's going to make a giant difference. And it's called the uh, Affordability and Producibility Roadmap. But it, again, it's manufacturing driven. It may be a product design, but it's manufacturing driven. So I told you I was at Ford. When I was at Ford, I started in manufacturing, then I went to product design, and then 
because of stuff that I was doing similar to what uh, I'm going to be talking about today, I moved up to uh, I moved up to finance staff. Kind of an odd place for an engineer, but it worked out really well for me because it gave me the opportunity to find out how companies really and truly run and where the money is. So this is called the shadow diagram. I developed it in 1983. It's probably the most copied thing I've ever done in my whole life. Everybody uses the data. Nobody knows where the data is, but I got it. So when I was working for finance staff, I found out that if, if a program, I, I could look at all the programs, but through the life of a program, I, had, I found out that about, um, as, far as, uh, as far as cost is concerned, about 50% of the cost goes into material, 15 into labor, 30% into overhead. When we were at Ford, it was really simple to find out how we were going to do uh, things if we were going to cut cost. Squeeze the suppliers, beat the workers, and close plants. That's how it really worked. That's really and truly how it worked because I was in the executive uh, suite as well. I was in world headquarters, and that is how they were doing things. They were focusing on those big numbers that are obvious. But in essence, what happened was when I started really digging into it, the shadow was more important than the, uh, than the obvious answers. And what wound up happening was we found out that it didn't matter what plant it is, uh, it was about 5%. It could affect about 5% of our ability to influence profit, quality, and everything else. Labor, didn't matter, was the most militant or the most friendly of all plants, 5%. Material, we had 20% because uh, I was always worried about a Firestone kind of situation which ultimately did hit Ford. But the guy at the bottom here, that 5%, he controls 70% of your destiny. Actually, not your destiny. It's 100% of your destiny. It's 70% of the company's destiny, and nobody cared. Nobody paid attention. There's auditors for you. You have, you have, you have all kinds of auditors that come in. There's quality auditors. There's customer auditors. There's government auditors. They come and look at your stuff. If you're in finance, there's auditors all over the place. But where's the auditor for the guy who's doing the design? There isn't any. They get away with anything they want. So what we needed was something that was going to give us a holistic approach to getting the job done, but it had to be something that was going to allow us to scrutinize what was going to come to us eventually. And we wanted to hit it all. So the product design engineer, he's going to come up with something, and we call this the ripple effect. He tosses that design into the, into the water, and now it's uh, manufacturing's turn. It's your turn to take it over. So it's kind of like the over-the-wall kind of a process. There's some factories or some companies that do have a good trade-off, but for the most part, it's not, that, it's not as brilliant as maybe it could or should be. So what we want to do is uh, we want to remember that manufacturing can only do, uh, a, uh, can only do the job based on what it's, what it's given. And again, we get back to that handoff. So this is a kind of a little chart that I think is kind of important. This is done by, uh, by a couple of guys at Harvard, um, uh, Steve Wheelwright and Kim Clark. And what they did was they, saw, they call this the cornucopia of profit. In essence, the further you go upstream, the more likelihood you're going to make money. The correct decisions that you make up front are going to uh, kind of like get rid of the problems that you've got on the, on the, on the factory floor. But if you look at where our tools are, here's value analysis and value engineering, and I'm a member of that association, and I kind of like know what goes on there. Here's uh, where Six Sigma is kind of used, and I know a little bit about that. I used to hand out the awards for, uh, for black belts when, at Texas Instrument and Motorola. I've been around that for a long time, and M Monroe and Associates got a lot of those people. But look at how far downstream they are. If we look at where we can make a difference, CAE tools, that moves us up to basic design. And PLM, program management tools, they kind of like get into the concept investigation, but that's where you need to be in order to win. Both Steve Wilwright and Kim Clark said we need an upfront tool that has a holistic approach in order to make things happen. Monroe & Associates wasn't big enough to make that tool work up until um, our wonderful government threw us a few bucks. Now, it's one thing to talk about this, but it's quite another to see it in action. So I've, um, I've given you all, or my guys have given you all, one of these, one of these little cards, okay? And in essence, we're going to do a little bit, not a whole lot, but a little bit 
to find out how good or bad a product design can be. This is um, enough to say that, um, at least from a labor standpoint, it won't be that bad. It's simple and it's easy, and I only got a half an hour, so this is all I can give you. Um, I want you to look at the two things that, uh, that are, or the two statements that are made. Does the part have to move, and does the part have to be a different material? If it has a yes on either one of those, uh, those answers, uh, then it's a, and it's, it's a necessary part and we can leave it alone. But if it's uh, no when you come to that, it doesn't have to move and it doesn't have to be a different material, then it's a candidate for elimination or combination. It turns red and it turns into a bad part. If it looks like a spring, if it looks like a belt, or if it looks like a bolt or any other fastener for that matter, it's a candidate for elimination right off the bat. Now. This is based on mechanical stuff, but we also got them for electronics. And of course, a lot of you guys do food processing and whatnot, same sort of a deal. It's a little easier though to make a little example using a mechanical product. So this is the first part value challenge. So what we're gonna do is um, I'm, gonna, um, I'm gonna show you an example of a small part. It's only got five pieces in it. But unfortunately, it's made by American workers. Now. We all know that American workers are being thrown out on a daily basis, right? And the reason for that is, does anyone know why we're throwing out those American workers? Apart from the fact they're too expensive. Well, they're lazy, stupid American workers. I mean, that's what we've always heard, right? So that's why we got to get rid of them. Now, I'm going to show you um, a little example today, that little example. We're going to put that together. And I brought in a couple of those American workers at great expense. We brought them in from Detroit. One, two, let's give a round of applause for our two American workers and bring them up here. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much for volunteering. It's always nice to get a good volunteer, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go, typical smart ass. Oh, oh, sorry, no, no, I didn't mean that. Okay, so first thing we gotta do is, uh, yeah, we. <laughs> First thing we got to do is we've got <laughs> got to go on break. <laughs> you really are American workers. So we're going to ask these guys to put this together. So first thing you need to do is train them, right? So watch this. See the spring goes right inside that little pocket right there and that scallop that generously provided by the product design engineer. Then you pick up the latch and put that in place. Then we put the washer in. Now, normally we would have a 1700 RPM uh, torque monitor angle coated rundown tool, but today just use your fingers. We're trying to save money on tooling, okay? So <clears throat> otherwise we're gonna have to send it to China. So anyways, you screw that down, right? Like that, and then check for quality. Got it, got it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we're gonna ask our American workers to put this together. Now, um, of course, we'll need to figure out some way of determining how, what kind of a good job they did. So I'm gonna time them, okay? Are you American, or sorry, are you ready American workers? Go, go. Okay, so while they're doing that, let's talk about this. Now, everybody here knows that, um, that as people get good at their jobs, right, they might start off uh, high, but, but as they get better and better and better over, uh, over the number of units that they manufacture, we go down and we start, we start making money, right? right? That's the profit line. So you start off and it takes a long time, but as time goes by, it gets better and better. So, um, and speaking of time going by, folks, uh, you're at the uh, 50-second mark. It, probably the reason for this is because they ate paint chips at a child, or maybe they didn't get a high school education. It's hard to say which. Okay, let's see that. Very good. Does That's that frozen work? solid. Does yeah, yeah. Work? No, that don't work. It, uh, uh, high achievement award. Thank you very much. Okay, you got to take yours apart. No, no, we need to have two of them assembled. If you wish, you can confer, but I'm just really curious as to how badly you screwed, how badly you did here. So let me have a look. Ah, oh, you ruined the screw. You must be an executive. Let me see here. No, it doesn't give you it. But anyways, uh, normally executives will do that. So let's try that again, but bear in mind that the clock is ticking, and, um, and we're, uh, and, and we're, and, and I only got let, I only got 18 minutes left, so let's haul it here, friend. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, wait a, wait a minute. See, now here's your problem. You're trying to cheat by putting that. I didn't show you that. You should have paid attention to uh, 
What's your name? Eric and Amir. Amir. Eric and Amir. Okay, see, you have to lay it like oh, that. Okay, now, nice. see, one of the other things is, look at this. Look, there's a pocket here, and it's got a bump on it. And there's another one right there. Wasn't that clever? That made it almost symmetrical, which means that it's a pokey oak issue. So I'm going to help you out here, simply because I need to get you off the stage. Okay, so here we go. Here, you can, you can screw that together. And, yeah, that'll try and save a little of your face, but... Don't bank on it. Okay, so there we done. Ah, Tara, let's give these guys a big round of applause. <laughs> so, so we got uh, two minutes and 10 seconds. Wow, that's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, two minutes and 10 seconds. How many, how many parts do we see here? Five parts? Five parts? And it took them two minutes and 10 seconds. Who would have guessed it, right? So we look at this and we say that, oh, Eric and Amir are going to get better and better, right? They're going to, they're going to, and pretty soon they start getting, they start making some money, right? But there's a problem. Eric just is tired of dragging Amir along like a bag of rocks. And so Eric leaves. And what was your name, ma'am? Michelle. Michelle. Michelle comes on board. Michelle comes on board, and, um, you know, the, the line goes up because Amir has got to show Michelle the ropes, right? Uh, but you know what he does? And between the two of them, they're making money for the company. And then what happens? What happens? Well, Amir and Michelle decide that uh, they like each other, they hate the job, they open a taco stand, and they take off. So where's your knowledge base go now? Right back up here. This is what we call, what is that called? What do we call this? I'll bet you use it every day. We call this a learning curve, right? That's a learning curve. So we learn over and over and over again that we got a bad design. That's what we learn. But we're smart. We're really, really smart. We're going to try and do something entirely different. So what do we do? Well, we farm it out or something, right? So first thing you do is uh, yell at the workers, right, which inflames the unions. Then we go over and squeeze the suppliers, right? So we go to the guy that's making the plastic parts and demand a, a reduction in the cost of the plastic. What does he do? Well, he's not stupid. He just adds more water to the plastic because you didn't put that in your spec. You still buy by the ton. He's just sipping you a lot more water. Your, uh, <laughs> your utilities bills go up, but you know what? Everybody's happy because in purchasing, it looks like the price went down, piece cost, right? And then we go over to global sourcing. Yeah, we got screws coming from Chile and, and these washers from Tibet, right? Yeah, and then the screws show up and they don't have the same metric as what we have here in the U.S. But don't worry, the guys on the floor can just chase those, right? We'll put a little threading chaser on there and we'll be all set. And then your washers show up, right? The washers show up, they don't have a hole in them. So the purchasing agent says, hey, where's the hole? Oh, that's extra. So, you know, you wind up with little problems. Did you know, no problem, we've just got a big pipeline, we just have to drill those holes until the new products show up, right? The correct ones. And then the last one, how do you get springs cheaper overnight? Anybody know? Oh, well, you just buy in bulk. See? You guys think I make this shit up, don't you? Absolutely not. No way in heck. See that? How can you, how can, that big ball of iron, that's springs. They come in that great big giant box. You can see that big cardboard box at the bottom. How do you think the operator deals with that? He uses a divine approach. He shakes it. Whatever God wants will fall off. The rest, into the scrapper. But we save 20%. And then we threw 80% in the garbage. The chasing for cheap is not really a clever idea. What we really want to try and do is try and figure out how to do the job right the first time up front using a holistic approach. And that's where we start looking at this again. So I want you to pick up your little card. Okay. I want you to look at this uh, product design right here. I want you to look at how many parts you can eliminate immediately by saying these are non-value added parts instead of just using a value analysis. And by the way, this all comes from Miles and Gage. This is where I found out about this stuff. Miles and Gage had this nailed, but nobody ever went into the product design. So I want you to get rid of the things that we don't want right off the bat and then find out how many parts have to move and how many parts have to be a fundamentally different material and I'm going to give you five seconds to redesign this. One, two, three, four, five. How many parts do we need? 
Look at your chart. Don't look at that. How many parts have to move? How many parts can you eliminate because they fall into the category of springs, fasteners, and belts? And how many, what's the number? This must be a shy group. Two. two. Yeah, two. There you go. I knew you'd spit it out eventually. There you go. Okay, so here we got two parts. What a surprise. I happen to have two that look just like this. But too late. We've already shipped it off offshore, right? It's gone to uh, China or Japan or India or Korea or wherever else that they've got, um, they've got people that will work cheaper. So what we've done, though, is we found, um, we found two Korean workers, which are much smarter than those two American slugs we had before. And we're going to bring them up to try and do this job correctly. One, two. Let's bring them up with a big round of applause. Yes. Yeah. I'm just hoping we don't get a blood pressure issue. OK, good. So anyways, here, watch this. OK? See those two slots? Yep. There's two tabs. Drop, push. OK. Let's see how fast you can get this one done. Are you ready? Oh, this is like, hang on a second, where's my sweep hand? It's a problem with getting old, you go blind. Are you ready? Yep. Go. Done. <laughs> five, se five seconds, good job. <laughs> he's, still not gonna, he's still not gonna work with you though. Thanks very much. Oh, hang on a second, here you go. Here, here uh, for humiliation purposes, you get, a, you get a free toy. Okay, so let's look at this uh, new, uh, new operation, okay? Five seconds. Two, and a, two minutes and 10 seconds down to five seconds. How much faster do you think you could do that job next time? I'm going to ask uh, Mir. How, how fast? I mean, I, you were done in about a minute, or a, in, a, in a second. How much? Uh, probably three, down to five seconds. three seconds. And you know what? That's a good answer because that's probably as good as you can get. What do you call that? Well, before we called it a learning curve, what do you call this? That's the way you're supposed to do the job. And you know what? It doesn't matter whether I'm looking at these little stupid uh, little doors or whether I'm looking at a car. Right now we have 80,000 square feet of cars torn apart in one of our operations. We've got two operations, and one of them is filled up with cars looking for the brilliance, not the mundane. And you know what? Everybody else in the world is doing it as well. And it doesn't matter whether it's a car or it's a submarine or, or whether it's a tank or actually a chocolate bar because we've worked on all of them and they all do the same thing. We can make things happen if we can get in early. Manufacturing people have to take the lead. They have to take the lead and they have to do it soon because we're running out of things to do here in the United States. So if you happen to be in manufacturing, I want you to look at that five-part product and the two-part product, and tell me how you're going to out-manufacture your competition. Your competition's got the two-part. What are you going to do? Are you going to use um, TPS, Toyota Production System, or Lean Manufacturing? Are you going to use Six Sigma? Are you going to use uh, cheaper labor? Are you going to use automation? Well, I came from automation. You can't do that. I can't automate that thing. You can't do it with cheaper labor. I don't care how cheap it is. That other guy's going to beat you every time, remember? Two minutes and 10 seconds versus three seconds at the end there with the, with the estimate we got. How are you going to win if you're making mechanical products? You have to go in and drive what's going to happen. You have to drive it. Manufacturing has taken a back seat too long. When I was at Ford, I was the club. I made things happen because I was in manufacturing and I was tired of getting beat on the head. That's why this whole thing got developed because I got tired of being beat on the head. Here's a good example from Ford Motor Company. They, in, they basically, like I said, uh, I started this kind of a process in 1983. Here's, here's something that just came out of a brand new car, a brand new Taurus. That's what it should look like, and that's how much money they put to the bottom line. That picture came from, uh, from the guy who's the executive vice president for um, uh, global engineering at Ford Motor Company. And his question was the same. Why is it that my guys Develop this instead of that. And it's real simple. Manufacturing didn't take the lead. 
they didn't do, you didn't do your, they didn't do their job, and you're probably not doing your job, you have to go in and start pushing. Okay? So that's the, that's the output of the analysis and whatnot. So that's where the numbers came from. And so if somebody says, well, how did you come up with that 2.8 million bucks? That's, that's where it comes from. So the big deal here is that that was good enough, but now what we can do is exactly what, I'm not very good with names, James Gaffney said this morning, he said we need a holistic approach. That's one thing. What I just showed you is designed for manufacture. That's one thing, one thing. But how does it impact the cost? How is it going to impact manufacturability? How is it going to impact everything else that's in the organization, including cash flow? That's what, we, that's what we've decided to, to work on. We've been working on it now for 18 months. And like I said, this is the first time that we've had the opportunity to roll it out, except for the government. Um, the government is, uh, or the Defense Department is going to do things a little bit differently. But in essence, oh, and here's the, I'm not very familiar with these last slides because I just saw them a little while ago. Everything's need to know. But there's the, uh, there's the, the, uh, the results on the first, uh, the first product. This is, um, this is a product that was uh, manufactured by, um, by uh, 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 who was it, DRS? DRS, yeah. DRS, and like I said, I wasn't involved with it. Only the people who were involved were the people who had to be involved. So um, what's the new producibility tool do? It gives us a roadmap to tell us how we're going to get the job done. It gives the opportunity, and it's mandatory that, ma that manufacturing get involved because you have to go through and answer questions that product design engineers can't because MRL, manufacturing readiness level, can only be answered by manufacturing people. So consequently, you'll never get something that says, you have to make this, and you say, I have nothing on the, I have no machine tools like that. I, I don't have a thing that can make this thing. Oh, sorry, you better find somebody else to do it then. That'll never happen again. We also have a producibility index and a confidence index. A producibility index that says, this is how good or bad that product is. And if you don't come up to the right produ producibility index, the product design goes back. You don't have to have a no build meeting. It just isn't going to go any further. And a confidence index, because quite frankly, the product design engineer and the marketing guys or the guys who are telling us what the customer's needs and wants are, they aren't usually in sync either. So, these things, and like I said, this is, uh, this is coming out of the Secretary of Defense's office. So uh, we're kind of like looking at something that's probably going to be rolled out to the Defense Department or de at least the defense contractors here real soon. The rest of this stuff, um, actually, I can't talk about because I'm out of time. So um, I'm going to, um, that's what the new output looks like, and that's what the confidence indexes and stuff like that. Um, happen. Uh, that's what. It, that's what it looks like. So, um, I, I've got to stop. So, uh, any questions? Uh, um, any questions that anyone might have on anything that I produce? I, I kind of like ran through that fairly fast. Um, I can tell you though that uh, if you want a less hectic um, version, um, you can come and see um, uh, Dave Lewick. You want to just stand up for a minute? Um, Dave Lewick, Joe Fjord, and uh, Dave Foreman uh, with the Yellow Tie In. They can, uh, they can explain that. And actually, we can show you examples, medical ones. Um, uh, these are other things for uh, bigger products. Anybody, uh, a question any, from anybody? No? Yes. Oh, over here. Sorry. Yeah, Harry. I'm just showing the presentation. So yeah, Harry. Just... If I miss this, tell me. Now, I saw some what looked like uh, DFMA. Yeah. You were doing that. Um, how does what you do or what you recommend compare to what uh, Boothroyd Dewhurst, for example, up in Providence would recommend? Right. Actually, uh, we used to use uh, the, uh, the Boothroyd Dewhurst method, but it, it never, it nev they wouldn't expand it. So now we have, uh, like I say, a manufacturing index. Um, we have the ability to do large and, and or say high volume and low volume kinds of examples. We have the ability to do MRL, which nobody does, manufacturing readiness level. Uh, the producibility index and the confidence index. The costing, our costing models are vastly different. Um, uh, again, 
uh, if you come to our booth, we can show you uh, what we're doing with, uh, uh, with different customers right now. Um, it's, the big thing was accuracy. Um, I mean, there's uh, booth rate doers. There's another, there's another program that does pretty good costing. If you're looking at ROM, rough order of magnitude called a priori. Somebody came up, hey, have you ever seen AP? Yeah, it's great. They were, we actually, Dave and I had lunch with the, or dinner with the guy that, uh, that invented this stuff. The problem is, is that it's good relative one to another, but it's, it's not what I can hang my hat on. So they want to get theirs uh, a little bit more robust, their answers, and we're willing to work with almost anybody. The other thing, too, is if I use BDI, I only have what they give me, whereas what we wanted or our customers wanted was, hey, you know, we want our own libraries. We want our own stuff to be put in here. We've already got a ton of stuff. We don't, that's nice, but we want our stuff rolled in. And, and then there's the size thing as well. BDI can handle a fairly big project, but we did the 787, and you can't put that in BDI. So there's a whole bunch of different things. And besides that, BDI is like the DFMA part, and then you've got a priori and a whole bunch of other guys that are doing costing. And then you've got some guys that are using MRL. And you've got something that's going on over here and a, lot of, a whole bunch of stuff. But it's not connected. And that's what we were looking for was a holistic approach. All these things all by themselves are great, but it isn't going to be the driving force that's going to get you to where you need to get to. And where you need to get to is world domination. I'm not <laughs> interested in working with people who are trying to catch up or get as good as their competition. <clears throat> I want to help people annihilate their competition. That's what, that's again, uh, I'm into it a little bit heavier than everybody else because everybody else has been so passive. We've lost so much uh, in the way of manufacturing capabilities in this country. It's time that we started to stand up and kick back. Unfortunately, we're out of yeah. time, so thank you so much. Okay, thank you.